tonight I was just thinking back to when I first came along to the centre uh, 18 years ago in 1998 and I didn't have a sense of what I was getting myself into um, I arrived I knew I wanted to learn to meditate but I didn't know what else to expect. In a certain way I was just taking it on trust that if I turned up and learnt to meditate something useful would happen, something beneficial would happen. And in the second week I met Maitreya Bandhu and he taught me the Metta Bhavana. And he said, if you do this every day for two weeks, you'll notice a difference. And so that's exactly what I did. I did the Metta Bhavana every day for two weeks and I noticed a difference. I'm sure he was relieved. Um, <laughs> but what looking back on that, that was tremendously significant. In a certain way, coming here and learning to meditate changed my life. Um, communicating, having that sort of confidence um, espoused by Maitreya Bandhu, he was so confident that if I did the Metta Bhavna, I'd notice a difference. It would change how I experience the world. Um, well, he was just so confident that that would be the case. He was just so sure. And for me, that had quite an impact. Um, for me, that I sort of instantly felt, uh, well, felt confidence too. I felt that sense of confidence transmitted um, I think I was receptive. I think I was hungry for it, hungry to just feel differently um, from the experience that was generally my experience. I wanted to feel differently. I wanted to meet experience differently. And so that one expression of confidence in a practice transmitted and made me confident, well, I'm just going to try this. I'm just going to test it and see if it works. Well, it did work. Metta Bhavna is now, um, for me, a lifeline. Um, it was a lifeline then. It was um, probably the most transformative um, thing that I've done in my life, is learn and practice the Metta Bhavna sincerely. Um, it helps me as I'm a nurse. Um, it feels the most appropriate response to the world. Um, but in a, in a certain way, taking on that practice and practicing it regularly and sincerely um, was my first act of going for refuge. Um, a first act of having something of the Dharma communicated. Um, for me, taking it on trust and practicing it sincerely um, over a couple of weeks and finding that it changed my experience. And, and in that, um, and from that, stemmed everything up until this day. Um, and I eventually ended up with one of these around the neck. Um, so be careful. You never know what learning the Metta Bhavna might do for you and how it might change you. We used to joke that um, Buddhism should come with a health warning. Um, but, you know, a healthy warning, actually. Um, it does change people. And that's the experience that most people had when they met the Buddha. Um, it was something um, that that was about the Buddha. It wasn't just what he said, it was who he was that affected people really, really strongly, very, very deeply, very profoundly. Um, 
he had a particular quality of being able to communicate exactly what people needed at the time that they needed it in the manner that they could hear. Um, good communication always is a bit like that. Um, and maybe the reason we're all here is because there's something that's happened um, in our lives that we wanted or just turned us around, that just made us want to, uh, well, just made us question, made us want to um, understand what life's about more fully, more deeply, or what, our, what our life's purpose is even. And, um, and maybe coming along to the centre, and maybe what's made you come back, is that, well, we've all heard something um, that's given us confidence in, uh, in, in Buddhist teaching, in the Dharma. Maybe it's just seeing somebody exemplify something uh, a particular quality of kindness, friendliness, um, generosity. Maybe it's a particular teaching um, that we heard that was expressed very clearly that just made us come alive, um, that re we resonated with very fully. Um, for whatever reason it is, um, at whatever level, when we move towards um, uh, going deeper, wanting to understand the Dharma or um, the Buddha or the Sangha more deeply, we are going for refuge. And one of Sangha Ratchita's most significant uh, contributions to the Buddhist world is the emphasis on the centrality of going for refuge as the primary act of being a Buddhist. So, so let's just rectify terms, because that's always a good place to start. So in going for refuge, what we're talking about is that committing oneself or placing the heart on the ideals of the Buddha as the ideal of enlightenment, the Dharma as the teaching of the Buddha, and the Sangha as the spiritual community of those practicing the Dharma. And that's, as a Buddhist, that's the central thing in one's life. So what Bhante has said, what Sangha has said, is going for refuge is primary, okay? Ethics is secondary, and lifestyle is tertiary, but also important, yeah? And, um, so when we think about uh, going for refuge, it really is the whole of the Buddhist life and it's the working out of uh, the Buddhist life um, very fully. Um, it's the thing we do when we, want to, when we want to turn up to the center, when we feel that movement of wanting to come to learn, wanting to grow, wanting to develop. It's going for refuge that's activated in us. It's that sense of when we want to go out to be generous to people, when we want to uh, develop greater awareness, it's going for refuge that's activated in us. Um, very, we might not even recognize it as such. We might not even recognize it as such. But what I wanted to do tonight was just sort of make that a bit clearer, make the act of going for refuge a little bit more clearly. Um, clearly expressed because often we hear the that it's the central act of being a Buddhist often we hear it's placing the heart on uh, often we hear it's committing to being uh, to um, learning the Dharma to practicing the ethical principles to meditating but those are sort of the outward expressions as it were of going for refuge um, there's something else in um, that, that's sort of underneath and driving all of that um, that we need to be aware of and we need to keep alive. So, so what I thought I'd do tonight is just explore that a little bit, okay? So, so when the Buddha was enlightened, um, when he'd become enlightened, he was sitting under the Bodhi tree 
Um, he'd had this profound realization. He'd seen beyond all limitations, or he'd seen through self, seen beyond, he transcended egotism. He'd uh, become an unlimited mind. And in that unlimited sense of experience, um, felt an intimate connection with all life and recognizing how interconnected and interdependent all life was. And on that basis of seeing through of that interconnected, interdependent, conditioned nature of all life had an upswelling of compassion for all beings, for all life. And, uh, and uh, an expression of that was his life's work of teaching the Dharma. Okay? And when the Buddha taught the Dharma, well, he didn't really teach the Dharma. Um, in a certain way, um, he, all, all he did was communicate to people. He had conversations with people about situations that they were in. Um, he just helped people make sense of particular situations as they arose, as he came across them. Um, uh, but that sense of what, what was contained within that communication um, was what was needed in that moment. And in a certain way, um, it was the enlightened mind communicating to the potential for enlightenment in other beings. Yeah? So often you, um, one of the ways of um, uh, uh, thinking about the communication from the Buddha is sort of like this ultimate um, uh, breadth, ultimate sort of infinite sense of experience and kindness resonating with the potential for uh, the ultimate in the person, in, the, in us. And when we hear something um, communicated in the Dharma um, that we resonate with, it's almost, you know, there's an opening. There's a, a softening. There's, um, there's a maybe, maybe we experience an upward lift of energy, a sense of coming into resonance with something greater, a sense of even beauty, um, resonating uh, with beauty, um, resonating with meaning, um, experiencing value. Um, so when we experience that. It's something of our potential resonating with the ultimate potential in the universe. So we could see that as a sort of moment of going for refuge, a sense of resonating with uh, the, ultimate in, the ultimate in us, resonating with the ultimate in the universe. Many people experience this when they met the Buddha. Many, many people experienced this when they met the Buddha. And they all had a similar sort of experience. And when you read in the, uh, in the traditional texts, there's uh, four very particular responses that arise in people. And I'll read them because I want to get them right, really. I'm sort of trying to do the uh, tradition justice. Um, so often the expression is um, very emotional, um, as the sense of wonder. They say it's wonderful, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a sense of awe, there's a, and, and a sense of the, sort of the languages of simile uh, that's used, just sort of the language of deeper emotion, really, um, that's used. It's as if something that was overthrown has been set up the right way. Yes. Um, so they feel uplifted. People feel uplifted when the Buddha, when they resonated with the Buddha's teaching, when the Buddha communicated <coughs> to them. It's as if something that was hidden has been revealed. Yeah. So there's a sense of something known more deeply, something, something resonating with something more true even. 
Um, the way has been pointed out to someone who had gone astray. So, so a sense of reorientation, a sort of redirection of being. And a great light has shone forth in the midst of the darkness. So it's very evocative, very evocative, very beautiful simile um, that's traditionally people's response to um, the communication, direct communication um, with the Buddha. And then following on from this, because the communication was so direct, so very, um, what was needed at that moment, people went for refuge. And they, you know, people felt the need to express that and say, for, from now on, to the Buddha for refuge I go, to the Dharma for refuge I go, to the Sangha for refuge I go. So there was a heartfelt response with the entire being. Yes. And really, um, perhaps we, if we think for a moment, if we think maybe there have been moments when we've had that sense of heart response to the Dharma or in a situation of communication or in a talk or just observing the Buddha even, just seeing the Buddha, seeing the beautiful figure. I was recently at Vajrasana, the new Vajrasana, and I walked into the shrine room for the first time and was, my heart almost stopped. Um, it's such a beautiful um, space with such an immense rupa, an immense figure of the Buddha in that room. And I was moved, deeply moved by it because it was just so beautiful. Um, but also there was something about the, well, Nyanavacha, so there was something about uh, taking ourselves seriously. Yeah. As a movement, we've suddenly just really taken ourselves seriously by creating this beautiful space that demands more of us. We'll need to grow up into it, as it were. And in a certain way, when those experiences happen, we, we need to... We, well, we can shy away from them or we can move towards them, we can grow up, we can grow larger to be with them, as it were. Um, I just felt deeply moved um, and that was enough, as it were, that was enough. I was moved by the beauty. In a certain way, um, uh, one of the things that, so when I was listening to some talks of Sangharachita, um, preparing for this, the, um, one of the things that he said was, well, we can't say that all beauty is truth, but we can say that all truth is beauty. Um, so that, that's just worth reflecting on a little bit. And it's perhaps, it re reminds me um, of an example that Sangharachit has used from the life of Ananda, um, because, well, we might respond to the Dharma, we might have something very clearly communicated to us that might wake us up to a sense of truth, and that might inspire us to go for refuge, to want to know more. Yeah? Um, in a certain way, if we're, going to, um, if we're going to go for refuge to the Dharma, well, there are probably some things we need to consider. Um, if we're going to go for refuge, we need to think, well, well, perhaps we need to understand the Dharma. We need to understand, we need to hear the Dharma. We need to listen to talks, maybe put ourselves in conditions where we get to access the Dharma. Um, but we also need to ask questions. Um, we need, you know, there's a lot of Buddhist uh, Pali and Sanskrit words, you know, if somebody uses them, ask for what they mean. Yeah? You know, really take note to understand um, what these terms mean. What's, you know, because often the words are very nuanced 
and have a variety of meanings and they're often used in a particular context. So ask what words mean. Ask questions. Clarify our understanding. Um, we might disagree. We might disagree. Well, it's very healthy. Yeah, it's very healthy to disagree. Um, and we might, um, but one of the most challenging things um, that I heard when I was learning the Dharma was, um, well, if you disagree, consider first that you haven't understood. <laughs> and, um, and clarify. Clarify further. So have we really understood it if we disagree? Yeah. And often it's our, our particular views or our assumptions we've made about practicing Buddhism. Um, or it's just a particular statement of demand on us which we're just not ready to take on. And we just go, ah, oh, no, that's enough. You know, the limit of my going for refuge to Dharma is just there. So if we don't agree, um, ask questions. And perhaps consider that we might not have understood um, the teaching fully. But we have to go further if we're going to go for refuge um, to the Dharma. It's not only enough uh, to agree or disagree or to clarify. We then need to reflect. We need to reflect on the teachings um, of the Dharma. We need to actually think, uh, think things through. What are the implications of this teaching for my life? What are, you know, how is this going to play out? If I really take this on, what are the implications? And um, this is quite a challenge because a lot of what, um, what's often communicated is you have to meditate, but you don't have to change your life. Um, that's not exactly true. Sorry. Um, if you're really sincerely practicing the Dharma, if you really are going for refuge to the Dharma, then it's important to reflect on the implications and it means that we may need to make changes in our lives. Um, and to really go for refuge means uh, taking on the implications and making changes to our lives uh, in accordance with that realisation, those reflections, those implications. So it does mean practising ethics, for example. It does mean... Um, changing particular practices and the way um, that we communicate even. Um, and uh, Deva Mitra gave some great examples of that last week and I'll just invite you um, to look at YouTube um, because he gave a very strong, very practical and um, uh, succinct summary of what it means to practice the training principles, the precepts of Buddhism. I won't dwell on them here. So, so yes, going for refuge to the Dharma, it means those things. It means reflecting. It means what are the implications. It means we might need to change our lives uh, in accordance with those understandings. And it uh, might be uncomfortable. But it also can be delightful. It's, it's both. Yeah. So, so the Buddha often communicated in the early days of, sort of ethically to people. But as I said, it wasn't only his, um, what he said, it was who he was. And um, often um, people would see, just see the Buddha um, and this was particularly true for Ananda. Ananda, surprisingly, is the guardian of the Dharma, the Buddha's attendant for many years, um, had a very retentive memory, had an agreement with the Buddha that if he ever was away, when the Buddha gave a teaching, the Buddha would repeat it to him afterwards so he didn't lose any of the Buddha's teaching. And it's because of Ananda we have the Dharma today because he heard every teaching the Buddha ever gave. And, um, and recited that um, after the Buddha's Parinirvana. Um, and all the teachings were disseminated as an oral tradition. And so you'd think somebody who 
had so much love for the Dharma would have been converted through a teaching, but he wasn't. He was converted through seeing the Buddha. He was converted by just, the Buddha just walked towards him and he just noticed how noble, how beautiful, how radiant the Buddha was, how remarkable a figure he was. And, um, and that was what converted him, which, which feels odd, doesn't it? It feels a bit strange. Um, but I have a certain experience, a sort of a reflection of a reflection of this. Um, when I um, was here, um, when Sangharachita Bhante was launching his book, What is the Sangha, 16 years ago. And um, he walked in to the shrine room. And I've never quite experienced anything quite like it. I felt compelled to stand. I didn't, you know, it wasn't demanded. Everybody just spontaneously stood up out of respect. Well, at least that's how I experienced it. But there was something about how purposefully and how beautifully he moved. Um, it was so very, um, oh, just beautiful to watch. It was the way he paced mindfully across the shrine room from there to here. And I was just very struck by it, very, very struck by it. The sense of how somebody can exemplify the principle of mindfulness just through their movement. And for me, that was a moment of sort of, I want to move towards that. I want to, you know, that embodiment, that beauty of movement and purpose. Um, there's something that I want to move towards to. Um, so just, yeah, it's, it's difficult to really communicate. It might even sound quite strange, but it's just in that moment. But not only that, um, on that evening he communicated um, well, I remember being actually a little bit disappointed because he only read poems. Um, I thought here was Bante, the founder of the movement, and he was going to, um, he was, you know, I was ready for a great teaching, and he read poems. And um, actually, it's only now, 16 years later, I realised how precious that was to have somebody. Um, who'd written on the basis of inspiration and creativity and wonder at the Dharma and life, um, stand there and share that. Um, in a certain way, his poems are the most creative uh, aspect of his being. In a sense, you get a real window of how wonderful um, the world might be uh, when you hear him. Um, read his poems. I read a poem of his, this is the Four Gifts poem, um, and um, yeah, it's, it's very moving, it's very, very moving. Um, but only now, looking back, I see that. Um, so there was that sense of just somebody embodied, yeah? somebody that made me want to move towards that quality of mindfulness and embodiment another moment where I felt closer to going for refuge. Yeah. So you see people sometimes just exemplifying um, the principles in movement or in speech um, that might make you more, that sense of going for refuge more alive. So people responded to the Buddha's person, um, to seeing the Buddha in terms of going for refuge. But not only that, and I'm going to pause in a minute just to see if there are any responses, but um, bear with me a little longer. Um, it might be what's drawn you back here is just seeing the Sangha. Is, um, one of the things I noticed when I came through the door for the first time, and I was feeling kind of awkward because I didn't know what I was walking into, and, um, you know... Uh, Will somebody walk up to me and say, have you heard the word of the Buddha? 
Um, who knows? I didn't know. Um, but, um, but somebody just smiled and was friendly and was kind of easy and light. Um, but you notice, and this is quite commonly the case, that you notice just the friendship between people, the kindly communication. Um, maybe somebody just pays attention to you. Um, I benefited a great deal from people just showing interest in me. I'm very grateful to people who just took me on, um, who just went out of their way to meet up with me. Um, couldn't imagine why they wanted to meet up with me. Um, and they just very, gave very freely in friendship and, um, and sort of invited me on retreat and kept on inviting me on retreat and you know, inviting me to meet up and um, well actually it was just friendship and kindness that resonated with me. Kindness is a particular value for me. Um, it's the thing I think is most important in the world actually. Um, love and kindness. It's the quality that I most resonate with in others. Um, it's the quality I want to embody most as much as I can. Um, but maybe it's the Sangha um, that draws people in, that makes us go for refuge a bit more fully, um, which wants to sort of resonates with us and makes us come alive a little bit more. Um, and on that note, on that sense of attention, on that sense of attention, there was a moment at that same evening with Sangharatita launching his book. Um, I'd been coming along to the centre for two years. I'd been on retreat. Um, when I went on the first retreat, it had such a tr strong effect on me. I just felt like so grateful. I felt so grateful. I wanted to give something back. Um, and um, so I was just helping out. And then Bantu was here and had that sort of moment in the shrine room. And then he was signing his books. He was signing his books, What is the Sangha? And we were all queued up. Um, it was a fairly long queue. And um, I was getting closer and closer. And my hands were getting sweatier and sweatier. And I was worried that I might warp the cover of the book. <laughs> I thought that might be disrespectful. <laughs> um, there were very strange ideas that you sort of gain when you sort of feel grateful for something or you feel something so important. But um, and I got closer to Chris and I saw people trying to engage him. And um, he just wasn't, he wasn't biting. He wasn't really he was just signing the book very mindfully and passing it back and signing the book and passing it back. And, um, and my mouth was dry as it is a little bit now. And... Um, and I was getting closer and closer, and I was like, what do I say, what do I say, what do I say, I don't know what to say. And it came, and I handed my book over, and I was like, I've got to say something. And I sort of fumbled out, um, I suppose the only thing to say is thank you. <laughs> and he signed the book, and he handed the book back to me, and he looked up and beamed, <laughs> and just said, Thank you. And it was such full attention, such incredibly full attention. Uh, I don't feel I've been given that kind of quality of attention ever in my life up to that point. And there was such joy and uh, uh, kindness and um, well, I don't know what colour his eyes are, but they looked crystal and bright blue. They were really dazzling. There was such joy. And it was like my fumbling attempt at gratitude had been reflected back and amplified, almost to the point where I sort of had to sort of lean back a little bit. Um, but it was, it, for me, that was a moment of conversion. Um, I had such confidence in him at that point I had no idea why, really no idea why. Um, 
but there was such a quality of mindfulness and joy and love and attention in that one expression that I was confident in him. I was confident in him as a teacher, I was confident in his expression of the Dharma, and I wanted to go for refuge. Um, and it's strange, it's strange how that happens. Um, but no matter which way it happens, whether it's hearing the Dharma, whether it's seeing the Buddha, or seeing the Sangha, um, going for refuge may arise. Um, but it's understanding that it's not, you know, your meditation, um, your, um, your going on retreat, your uh, reading of books, or whatever it is you do, or helping out around the centre, it's all an expression. What's underneath it is that heartfelt response to the Dharma, which is going for refuge, that makes you want to move towards that much more fully, much more sincerely, much more confidently, as it were. So I'd just like to pause there before we go on to more detail about it and see if there are any questions or responses. fine if they're not. Shall we move on? So, so Bhante has um, said that there are levels of going for refuge. Um, so when we're going for refuge, when we're experiencing that heartfelt connection with the Dharma, in a certain way there are some preliminary stages to that. Um, and he's enumerated six levels of going for refuge. I don't know if you're familiar with these, but there's, there's always a list in Buddhism mm -hmm. to help you remember. So, so at the most fundamental level, at the most sort of uh, basic level, as you were, there is cultural going for refuge. Um, and this is, this is an expression, so if you sort of look back to the Buddhist East, um, many countries have had um, Buddhism alive in the country for, you know, thousands of years. Um, and um, there's a subtle sense of people being born Buddhists, as it were. They will tell you, you know, I'm born in a Buddhist country, I'm born a Buddhist, as it were. Rather like um, we here might be born Christian, or born Catholic, or born whatever religion or culture that might be resonating with you, or we might have come from. And not mentioning them all is not prioritizing any, just to be clear. Um, but brevity just for time. Um, and so there's this sense of you may just um, observe particular rituals um, on particular days. Um, on particular festival days you may go to the shrine, you may go and um, recite the refuges and precepts as it were. And, um, and that would be it. Yeah? You, um, I was speaking to a, a Thai friend of mine and he'd um, recently done his 10 day service as a monk in the monastery um, because it's traditionally um, appropriate and it's good for your family if you do. Um, so he has no intention of um, carrying on uh, being a monk, but it was the right thing to do, as it were. And, um, and in a certain way, you know, you may have a shrine in your home, you may burn some incense, and, and so on. Um, but the, the level of going for refuge, the uh, commitment of going for refuge is very much just the way things are done around here. Yeah? And that's not to be critical of culture. Yeah? 
um, culture supports some very positive acts. And it's not to be standing su in, in any kind of superior way in relation to culture in the Buddhist East. Um, but I think the thing that we need to be aware of in that is not, um, not developing that kind of relationship with going for refuge around here, as it were. Um, we perhaps don't, we're not steeped in culture, um, but one of the, uh, the culture of Buddhism um, in the UK, at least not yet, um, but it might be that um, you know, we have a Buddha figure because it beautifies the house. Um, we might sort of appropriate culture, as it were, or appropriate images um, in a purely decorative manner. Um, we might um, be particularly impressed with particular forms or images. Um, I remember a friend of mine came to this, this center who had been previously quite involved with the Tibetan tradition and felt it was rather drab here um, because it wasn't full of wonderful creatures and um, guardians and beautiful paintings everywhere and it wasn't alive with sort of wrathful deities and, and he had this sort of kind of romantic relationship um, with the external appearances of Buddhism as it were so sort of watch for that tendency um, uh, do we have a particularly romantic relationship do we accumulate rupas on our shrine, but our meditation and our devotion uh, needs a little bit of work, as it were? We're buying another rupa because we, we feel it will help us meditate better, as it were. Is, are we collecting books, um, uh, a third of each we read? Nods of recognition. Um, so, do you see what I mean? So we could be just sort of culturally appropriating images and teachings, but we're not really putting them into practice. We're not really um, uh, sort of a sense moving towards um, going for refuge. We're not taking going for refuge deep, more deeply. We're just observing um, images. We're just sort of responding at a very cultural level, okay? Um, and I think one of the things that's very important, uh, and particularly for us as a young movement, is that we're still finding the cultural references for the Dharma uh, in the UK. Um, this is particularly why Sangha Ratchita Bhante emphasizes appreciation of the arts um, as objects uh, or as practices to refine um, the mind um, um, in, in communication. Um, why even the Rupa looks a bit Western, in a, in a sense. We can sort of see ourselves represented, perhaps, in the Buddha. Many people walk in here and say, oh, it looks a bit Western, um, just in the face, maybe. But it's about imagining um, a, a, a sort of a culture of Buddhism in the West, really, with our own references. And that's going to take some time. Um, but one of the most important things that Sangharachita has done, what I'm immensely grateful for, is making these traditional teachings alive and relevant uh, in modern Western life and, and translating them into practices and culture around our centers um, that make it possible for us to practice and to access these, what can be um, very culturally steeped, um, practices, as it were, from the traditional East. So cultural going for refuge. I've spent a bit of a while laboring that, but I hope you know what I mean. Any responses to that? Any questions to that? Any questions for clarification? Okay, we'll move on. So the next level of going for refuge is perhaps the, going for, the level of going for refuge that we experience more commonly when we're coming to the center, the level of provisional going for refuge. 
So, so at this level of Gove Refuge, we've gone a bit deeper. We've perhaps found out about the training principles. Perhaps we've undertaken to start practicing meditation regularly, although not always every day. Perhaps we come to the center regularly and we want to find out a little bit more about Buddhism. Um, perhaps we certainly need these conditions to remain inspired and to um, keep, um, in a sense, keep our practice alive, as it were. It hasn't really become self-sustaining. Um, we need good conditions to help us practice. Um, may, you know, we have moments where we're very inspired and practice is easy, and moments where perhaps we drop away um, from practice. Um, but we still feel ourselves to be Buddhist. At this point, we're sort of recognizing ourselves that being a Buddhist means practicing um, and means taking a bit of responsibility for our lives and practicing a bit more um, intensively sometimes on retreat. Um, last night, we had um, a festival day all day, and last night we had a puja and mitra ceremonies. And um, in mitra ceremonies, when people in a sense, they declare themselves to be Buddhist, but not only that, that they want to practice the precepts and they want to practice within this tradition. And um, they're sort of making their own personal commitment to, um, to growth and development and uh, practicing within the Buddhist tradition. And really this is the, in a sense, the, um, the level of provisional going for refuge. You're sort of, it's not a commitment to the order. It's, you know, you're not taking vows. You've not committed your whole life and orientated your whole life around um, practice of Buddhism. But you definitely feel yourself to be a Buddhist and you definitely um, feel you want to practice within a particular tradition um, because that continuity helps going deeper um, and understanding the teachings more fundamentally. So we have provisional going for refuge, and that's probably most of us here actually, but I won't make any assumptions. There may be some people who are effectively going for refuge. Um, but before we move on to effective going for refuge, um, do we have any questions about, or issues, claims, concerns about provisional going for refuge. Does it make sense? Do you recognize yourselves? I certainly recognize myself. Yeah? Okay. So I might have to move on a little bit more quickly because time is is disappearing very quickly. So, so you might over time, continue to go on retreat, continue to um, practice more intensively, and there's something that's responding in you that says, this, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, um, I'm putting more and more at the center of my life. Um, these are the most important things. Um, the example of the Buddha and the ideal of enlightenment, the teaching of the Buddha, is bringing the most meaning and value into my life. And I see it as, the, as having the possibility to bring meaning and value into the lives of others. And, and I want to practice very fully within a Sangha that's committed and is also placing the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha at the center of their lives. In a certain way, many people, when they feel that, ask for ordination, um, ask to be ordained, and then we spend the next however long working out why we asked. Um, in a certain way, I'm not being frivolous there, it's, it's, it's that heartfelt response. In a certain way, you don't know why you asked. You don't really know, but you feel 
that is the most important thing you could do with your life. You feel that going for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha um, is, in a sense, the purpose of your life. Um, it's what brings most meaning and value. And that um, is then worked out, as it were, through training for ordination. And it's, a, the, it's, a, it's when, in a certain way, um, you have a momentum of practice, um, you respond confidently to the teaching, you feel confident, as it were, in a certain way, um, that there's um, that the teachings are effective, that the teachings you can grow from, um, that the teachings make real sense, as it were, and you want to explore them more deeply. You want to change your life in accordance with those teachings. In a certain way, you're rigorously practicing. You're meditating every day. You see the vital importance of that. Um, we see the importance of um, friendship and generosity. We want to serve. We really want to serve the Dharma. We really want to help people. We want to help the Sangha. And we want to exemplify the principles, um, the ethical principles, as much as we can. Um, in a certain way, um, and we want to immerse ourselves more and more in this context um, to such a degree that it's really, you know, the centre and our friends in the Sangha become the sort of central forces, as, in, as it were, in our lives. Um, helping out at the centre. Um, I helped out for many years um, just because I had that sense of gratitude, really. The, the most response, sort of most mature response one can have, really, to having received something of value is gratitude. And you just want to give back. And it says that just keeps going deeper, and that keeps on uh, opening up, as it were. And, and then there's a moment where there's a sort of reflection. You sort of resonate with something true. Um, maybe it comes out of meditation, maybe it comes out of a life event, maybe it comes out of um, communication or a teaching where you just, you're just stopped and you resonate very fully with it and you think, there's something beyond me that's at work, as it were. There's something beyond my understanding, beyond my experience, but you have a taste of it even what uh, Sangharachita calls a reflection over the reflection of the unconditioned. Um, there's something of something really quite tangible that you just know that there's something more true than you're really normally experiencing, but it's in your experience, as it were, if that makes sense. And, um, and then there's... Um, in a, in a certain sense, that resonates with others. That resonates with others. And people sort of start sensing that you're ready for ordination, as it were. And at that point, you're effectively going for refuge. There's a rigorous practice regimen. There's study, there's generosity, there's confidence, there's faith. And there's that sense of the truth, as it were, the sense of reality, that sort of breath, that taste. Um, that seems to just be a bit alive. So, you're effectively going for refuge. So, but you continue. You continue. Maybe you don't, you don't have to have one of these um, to effectively go for refuge. You just have to commit. You just feel that you want to commit. Um, but many of us feel that um, that taking ordination, taking vows, is the way of committing that um, really, in a sense, doesn't, uh, you can't hide anymore. You know, I use my order name at work, and it often uh, raises questions. And so you're sort of, you know, you, you can't really hide when you're sort of out as a Buddhist. 
you know, your grumpiness doesn't really wash. <laughs> um, people say, well, that's not very good, is it? <laughs> but um, do you see what I mean? You know, you can't, you know, you have to take responsibility. And you feel like you've got something to uphold, actually. You've got something that's cherished and important and really valuable that needs to be upheld um, through one's practice and one's conduct. And uh, in a certain way, being out, as it were, really facilitates that. <laughs> Maybe, um, maybe, maybe it does. So, but we continue to practice. We continue to practice even more intensively. And um, there's a moment, um, there may be several moments. Um, maybe we're reflecting on impermanence. Maybe we're, um, we're steeping ourselves in the principles of... Um, conditionality, we're seeing how everything is dependent on conditions, we're reflecting on that, we're turning it over in our minds. In a sense, we really uh, practice intensively over a long period of time. Um, and there's a moment where one lets go. Um, one lets go of view, views, as it were, and lets go and... Um, Something in your being lights up. Um, something, uh, as it were, um, it's as if something comes from outside you um, that communicates very directly and the whole of your being lights up. It's not an intellectual understanding. You know, you can understand that all things are impermanent. You can understand that if things are insubstantial, things change. Not only do things change, but all things change. It's a very different thing um, to knowing that with one's whole being. Um, in a sense, there's an emotional turning about when one knows it at the level of the emotions. One really knows it sort of in the bones, in the blood, as it were. And the whole being lights up with that quality of realization. And there are many stories within the tradition where um, uh, you know the Zen master sees the leaf drop from the tree and in that moment insight arose, as it were. And it doesn't have to be um, uh, anything particular, it can be something very every day, but because you've reflected, because you've taken on the teacher, because you've practiced intensively, because we've clarified and uh, refined the mind and made the mind pliable and open and we're full of metta, as it were, we've worked, we've cultivated metta, eventually something will light up. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's what the tradition says. Um, we take it on trust, and um, but there can be moments, many moments of this sense of resonance, sense of light, a sense of something really deeply understood, deeply known, um, that isn't a sort of intellectually or cognitively known, but known with the heart, known deeply, much more deeply than the intellect, um, and that turns us in a sense the the response to that is to um, know that there's a deeper truth in the universe as it were there's a, there's a reality in the universe that we're not always in contact with but can in a sense meet us in a certain way um, I think in Jan of Archer you know if we look towards reality sometimes reality looks back as it were um, that's a, a way of you know, something comes to meet you, as it were. So in at this moment, in that moment of turning about in the mind, in the heart, where we light up the realisation of the reality of seeing things as they really are, is the moment where we are really going for refuge, of real going for refuge, um, where that insight uh, arises or dawns. And well, that just keeps on going. 
then you're in the grip. You were in the gravitational pull of enlightenment from that moment on. In a certain way, you can do nothing but go for refuge. You've developed escape velocity. And, um, and you can do... It's so that everything in your life is orientated to a dharmic perspective, as it were. And you just keep following that up. And you keep following that up. And... In a, in a sense, that movement that is from material things to a reliance on qualities and sort of love becomes a reliance on truth and reality. That sort of movement in us moves from the material to reality, as it were. And eventually, with sustained practice, with sustained letting go and seeing through, ultimate going for refuge arises at the point of enlightenment. And um, Bhante says something very well, there's very little to say about that um, in, a, in a certain way. There's, a, there's an ultimate seeing through, an ultimate letting go of uh, conceit, a letting go of I, a seeing through that this is a delusion set up by a mind, a dualistic mind, a mind that sees things in terms of me and you, self and other, this and that. Um, this is seen through as um, we resonate with the reality of conditions, of conditionality. Um, and we see through that. We see through all limitations and concepts. We realize things have no names. They're just labels. Um, and we realize our intimate connection with all life. And the response of that is love. Um, the only response to that can be love and compassion. And then you see the final going for refuge, that the universe itself is going for refuge. The universe, uh, what Sangharachi calls cosmo, cosmic going for refuge. And this is uh, probably poetic for the scientists in the room, just to be clear. But that sense of that evolutionary process of ever-increasing refinement and development that's been continued, that we are the product of, that we are the universe that's become conscious of itself. Um, that that evolutionary process is ever ongoing. That development and growth and refinement and um, is, is not only what we're doing, but is what the universe is doing. Um, and on that, we will stop. <laughs>